Good morning, everyone. Happy Sabbath. We are continuing our discussion on the Antichrist Showdown, Part 38, The Image of the Beast. And in the times we're living in now, we are going to very, very, very soon know without the sh beyond the shadow of a doubt what the image of the beast is, because it will be before our very eyes. Now, in this discussion, we have sought to look at the different verses pertaining to the Antichrist power in the last days. We've gone on to explain things like Daniel chapter 11 and 12 and Revelation chapter 13 going beyond just the sea beast which was papal Rome and to look at all the verses that pertain to the Antichrist and who it identifies. And as we've seen thus far, Antiochus IV is basically what we would call a straw man argument. You know what a straw man argument is? It means the argument is so weak it, 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 it can't stand up on its own. Many people use this sort of argument to try to prove their point. They, they give you the opposing person's viewpoint as a straw man and then they knock it down. But this is a legitimate straw man argument. It cannot stand upon its own. Nero as well. The devil mixing his DNA with human DNA to make that's complete nonsense, as we found. Obama, Trump, now maybe Biden, Islam. No one fits all the specifications. No one, except the papacy. So, as we get started, let's have a word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, Lord, this morning, we ask you for the gold tried in the fire. We ask you for the eye salve that we might see and the white raiment that we might be clothed and that our nakedness does not appear. Lord, we ask you to give us discernment in these, in these times to show us what your will is and what you would have your people do in these last days, the messages you would have them give. In Jesus' holy name, amen. So, the image of the beast. Let's take a look. First, let's summarize. Revelation chapter 12, we saw the great woman. We found that to be God's true church. Clothed with the sun in the New Testament and the moon at her feet, the Old Testament, so God's church throughout all time. The 12 stars, the 12 great leaders, 12 apostles, 12 tribes of Israel. And then we had the great red dragon appear. It was symbolic of Satan, but also pagan Rome. Remember, Mrs. White said it was also symbolic of pagan Rome in the great controversy, seeking to destroy the child of the woman. So who is the child of the church? Jesus, right? So the child of the church was Jesus. Now, Jesus is born of the church, right? The true church. And then he's caught up to heaven. And then the church is forced to flee into the wilderness, which we found the wilderness symbolic of uninhabited areas or, or obscurity, okay? Where she must stay 1260 years during the papal supremacy. Then, interestingly, Revelation chapter 12, verse 17, identifies who God's true church is in the last days. It says this, And the dragon was wroth with the woman, so the devil was angry at the church and went to make war, mostly spiritual but also physical, great deal of physical as well, but mostly spiritual, with the remnant of her seed. Now, what does that mean specifically, remnant of her seed? Jesus is the seed, right? So it was the remnant of the teachings of Jesus. So these are Bible-believing Christians. And here's what they do. This is what these saints do. They keep the commandments of God, not just the ones that make sense to them, not just the ones they like. They keep all the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus, which we found to be the spirit of prophecy. Then we get into Revelation chapter 13. We saw the beast from the sea, 
It's revealed to be Papal Rome having the seven heads, ten horns, just like Daniel chapter 7. The names of blasphemy on its, on its heads. Uh, it continues 42 months, same time period that the church was in persecution, which was during papal supremacy. And it makes war with the saints. It's an amalgamation of the other beasts or empires which were before in Daniel chapter 7. And remember, we saw that aspects and doctrines and teachings and structure of papal Rome actually still to this day have uh, characteristics and teachings from Medo-Persia, from ancient Babylon, from Greece. So those beasts in a way, live on through Rome. Now, Rome suffers a deadly wound in 1798 when General Berthier entered into Rome, broke papal political power, and exiled the pope, who later died. But this wound is healed in 1729 when Mussolini signs the Lateran Treaty and Germany signs the Reichs Concordat. And then right here it says, I'm sorry, it's missing on the page there, it says, reinstituting papal Rome as a sovereign political power. And oh, yes, also, interestingly enough, do you know that? And we looked at this. You remember Mussolini actually paid, paid the papacy reparations for them losing their papal states back in 1798. So there was a direct connection between 1929 and 1798. There's a direct connection between the wound being made and the wound being healed. To start healing. To start healing. Yes, yes, to start healing, of course. It's not fully healed until they're back in full supremacy. That's a good point. Thank you for pointing that out. Now, continuing on, then next comes onto the scene, we have the beast from the earth. We saw that it was revealed to be Protestant United States of America, which with its two Christ-like horns of republicanism and Protestantism, those are the two rulers of, the United, of Protestant America. So there was an understanding of Christian principles found in the Constitution and Declaration of Independence, but then he speaks as a dragon. Now that doesn't mean America uh, always acted Christ-like. It means that the principles that were in the Constitution and Declaration of Independence were Christian principles. They were Christ-like principles. When you look at things like slavery, which we've talked about, when you look at the dealings of the United States government with the Indians in many cases, many times those are not at, in any way, shape, or form Christ-like behavior. But the embodiment of the document, the principles themselves that were found there, the promises that, were, that are there in the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence were Christ-like principles. But this power begins to speak as a dragon. It begins to tell lies. And when a beast speaks, Mrs. White says that it speaks through its legislation. That's how a power speaks. So there will be a legislation, and we looked at Sunday law. Nothing new. What was, the, what was the issue back in pagan Rome? Sun worship, right? Sun worship. A Sunday law from Constantine that we looked at. Papal Rome, Sunday worship, or uh, sun worship, and a Sunday law as well. The more things change, the more they stay the same, right? Same thing. And we've seen how this has already been in the pike with Laudato Si. We look at Dies Domine. This has been on their minds for some time to institute this. Dr. Joshua, you want to say something? He's got the mic up there. <clears throat> Is it on? There you go. Yes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, also, in pagan Rome, the problem with the Christians as is portrayed in the book of uh, Fox, book Fox's of, Book of Martyrs. Book yeah. of Martyrs. They were rejected not only because of their lifestyles, the way, the philosophy that, that they took from Jesus, 
to behave in that society, but also because they kept the Sabbath day mm -hmm. as holy while they were keeping Sunday as song worshiping. But there, there is something else that he pointed out, this author, John Fox, in that, in that great book. And uh, he, he pointed out that they were politically incorrect because, because Caesar was known as the Lord. Yes, that's and, right. Carry and us. then they said, no, he's, he's not the Lord. The Lord is Jesus, who is the King of kings and Lord of lords. Right. So they, they were, they, they were um, rejected because they were politically incorrect. Absolutely. Uh, the, um, the, the world was divided by, right. by then. And the, uh, of every five Roman citizens, one was a Christian. So um, the, that is the, uh, the, the statistic. Wow. But yeah, um, now we are coming into a world that is becoming more divided because of COVID. Absolutely. But they weren't politically incorrect for the sake of being politically incorrect. They were politically incorrect when it came to God's law. And pagan Rome, and I believe that we looked at this as well, the number one thing, at least on paper, that they put down as to why they uh, executed these Christians in early times was because they refused to burn incense to the Caesar. That was the, that was the test that they had to do. In, in papal Rome, the number one reason why they would burn true Christians um, at the stake was because they refused the Eucharist. That was the number one thing on paper. Now, there was a lot of other reasons why, but when it came down to whether or not they decided they were going to burn this person, because a lot of times they couldn't, they couldn't argue with a Christian and debate with them with their tradition versus Scripture. They couldn't do it. So at the end of the day, they would have to say, will you accept the Eucharist? Will you bow down to the Eucharist? No. Burn them. So that was the, the thing that they put down. But anyways, moving on. Revelation 13 paints a picture of the of Protestant America becoming just as, power as, uh, just as powerful as the beast from the sea. It won't be weak. I know it appears to be that way now, that America is getting weaker and weaker and weaker. There's gonna, it's just a reorganization process. Revelation 13 is very clear. Protestant America will be extremely powerful. Protestant America, listen to me. Protestant America will be extremely powerful. It exerciseth all the power of the first beast that was before it. It will be just as powerful as papal Rome. Now think about that right now. Is that how things look right now? At least on the surface level? But what's going on underneath the surface? For, now, the, the Protestant America forces the whole world to worship papal Rome. By keeping their commandments, we pointed that out, that's how they force their worship. And again, pointing back to a Sunday law. Next, the evil work of the Sunday Law Institution is accompanied by great miracles. Remember the fire that comes down from heaven that Protestant America is able to do. They produce great miracles and wonders from heaven. Fire, symbolic of the Holy Spirit, comes down from heaven, but it's a false Holy Spirit. Comes down from heaven in the sight of men so that the whole world, it appears that God is with the Sunday Law. But it's all deception. And that's where we are right now as we're looking through. Now we're going to take a look at the image of the beast. So we've looked at pagan Rome and the devil. We've looked at papal Rome, the beast from the sea. We've looked at the United States of America and the Protestant principles that were there, still are, to a greater or lesser extent. And now, we are looking at this moment, and, and really, in the scheme of time frame that we're actually living in right now, we're at the same spot as, as this message is. 
right now. We are on the verge of seeing these things come to fruition. We are on the verge of seeing the fire come down from heaven in the sight of men and the image of the beast being set up. And then the receiving of the mark for all the people. And if 2020 and 2021 have taught us anything, it is that people are going to do whatever the government tells them to do. So, the image. Revelation 13, verses 15 through 17. And he had power, that's the beast from the earth, he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. So it creates an idol, right? But unlike the idols in the old days, this idol can speak. This idol can actually speak, unlike the idols before. Now, of course, this is in a spiritual, symbolic sense. We're going to take a look at that in a second, but keep that in mind. And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, that's everybody, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell, save he had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Now, I didn't always understood, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't always understand what this meant specifically, that everybody on earth receives the mark of the beast, but then there's other people that they don't actually have to receive the mark of the beast. They can, they can have the number of the beast's name instead. How do you guys make sense of that? What's it talking about there? Everybody receives the mark, except there, there's a few. There's a few that don't. And they simply receive the number of the beast's name. Anybody have any ideas? You want me to tell you what I think it is? Do the elites play by the rules that they give everybody else? No, they don't, do they? They don't. Do you think it's possible that while they force the entire world to worship and receive uh, the mark of the beast on Sunday, the false Sabbath, the Sunday law, that they themselves actually won't be keeping it? And they'll be doing whatever they want on that day? Will they be going to heaven? No. <laughs> because why? Because they're in league with Rome, right? So they have the number of his name instead. That's what I think. Paul, you want to add something? I do. To illustrate a current event that happened uh, Memorial Day this year, the governor of Michigan, while he locked everything down, you couldn't go out on your boat, you couldn't go to the store, there's news footage of him and his family out on Lake Michigan in their boat. Yes, yeah. And he said it was a joke. Yep. And the people let him get away with it. Yep, same with Gavin Newsom, to give, too. Exactly, yeah, Gavin Newsom. To yep. give that exact uh, 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 example, case in point, they are not going to be practicing what they preach at all. Nope, it's just for the masses. For the goyim. So, up until 2020, 2021, I didn't fully understand what this meant. That there's, there's this other group that somehow doesn't receive the mark of the beast, but is clearly, is clearly in the lot of the transgressors here. They receive the number of his name instead. Well, I think what Paul's point just brought out is probably the meaning of that. There will be a mark of the beast law for just about everybody, but there will be another class who gets to live like gods on this earth and do as they please any day. But they won't be going to heaven because they are working directly with the Antichrist power, so they'll have the number of his name. Yes, Jesse. To me, I understand the reason this will be two powers. Either you on the Lord's side Make sure you. or you on the Satan's side. Either you on the Lord's side <laughs> or you on Satan's side. 
there's not going to be any, any in between. That's it right. may look like it's an in between, That's right. but you won't be on one of those sides. That's right. Absolutely. And the two sides are Sabbath keeping Christians yes. and those who either impose the false Sabbath and or keep the false Sabbath. Those are the two groups. All right. So Mrs. White gives us a little insight here on the image of the beast. Great Controversy, page 445 and 446, says this. When the leading churches of the United States... Let's just stop there just for a second. I know at the time frame that we're living in now, that sounds crazy, doesn't it? When the churches of the United States... They're not doing anything. America is going to get very religious very, very soon. When the leading churches of the United States, uniting upon such points of doctrine as are held by them in common, they've already done that, by the way, shall influence the state to enforce their decrees and sustain their institutions, then Protestant America will have formed an image of the Roman hierarchy and the infliction of civil penalties upon dissenters will inevitably result. The beast with two horns causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, that no man might buy or sell save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Revelation 13, 16 and 17, which we just read. The third angel's warning is, if any man worship the beast in his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God. The beast mentioned in this message, which is from Revelation chapter 14, whose worship is enforced by the two-horned beast is the first, or leopard-like beast, of Revelation 13. The papacy. The image of the beast represents that form of apostate Protestantism, which will be developed when the Protestant churches shall seek the aid of their civil power, of the civil power for the enforcement of their dogmas. So the image of the beast specifically is when apostate Protestantism follows in the exact same track that Papal Rome has in the past, where it not only um, flaunts itself as a spiritual authority, but also as a temporal authority, okay? So once Protestant America does that, then they will form the exact same hierarchical structure, the exact same image, if you will, mirror image of the beast power that existed before it. Nothing new under the sun, under the sun right? The more things change, the more they stay the same. Same thing, right? Nothing new under the sun. Like father, like son. That's a good one. That's a good one as well. So, the image of the beast, it's not specifically, it's not the Sunday law specifically, but it will include it in there. It's the exact image, replica, hierarchical structure, mirror image of what Rome has in the past. Bishop and king, both under the pope. Spiritual, temporal power. Did papal Rome have their own army? Their own army? What did they do? They used everybody else, right? They would call crusades, right? And they would gather people, people from other countries, not their own people, and they would promise them all sorts of spiritual blessings and, and absolve them of everything, right? Right? Is, does the evangelical world have an army, an actual army, standing army anywhere? The United States does, though, doesn't it? So what are they going to do? They're going to take control of it. That's what's going to happen. That's what we're told. Now it goes on. It says, the mark of the beast still remains to be defined. And we're going to look at that. After the warning against the worship of the beast and his image, the prophecy declares, here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Now listen to this, very, this next part very carefully because I believe that this is, this is one of the most well-said passages to help us understand exactly what's going on here. 
the Holy Spirit speaks to us and says this, since those who keep God's commandments are thus placed in contrast with those that worship the beast and his image and receive his mark, it follows that the keeping of God's law on the one hand and its violation on the other will make the distinction between the worshipers of God and the worshipers of the beast. Does that make sense to you? I mean, that's very, very clear, right? It means that our safety is in keeping the commandments of God. Now, we don't do that through our own strength. We're not legalists, right? We don't do that through our own strength. We do it by grace. The evangelical world doesn't teach that. They teach you that you're saved in sin. They teach you that the law has been done away with. The Bible doesn't teach that, does it? Or that, no, we're not under, the, we're not under the, the old law. The new law that Jesus said is love, right? Because Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. They say, yeah, but the new law that he gave is the law of love. Well, what is the law of love? It's the Ten Commandments. If you love somebody, are you going to steal from them? Are you going to commit adultery against them? Are you going to kill them? I love you. I'm going to kill you. Let's take a look at a couple passages real quick. And I'm going to, I'm going to be very careful here to use Paul. Because they use Paul to say that, that the law has been done away with. Many passages of Galatians, right? Turn with me to Romans chapter 3 to the very last verse. Verse 31. Verse 31. Romans chapter 3 and verse 31. And then keep your hand in Romans because we're going we're gonna to go through a couple chapters real quick. Romans chapter 3 verse 31, it says, Do we then make void the law through faith? God forbid, yea, we establish the law. We establish the law. Does that mean the law has been done away with? When you establish something, are you destroying it? No. Let's go forward a couple, a couple chapters to Romans chapter 6, verse 1. It says, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Are you saved in sin? No. Let's jump down to verse 15. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? God forbid. Know ye not that whom ye yield your servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom you obey, whether of sin unto death or of a, a, obedience unto righteousness? What does obedience mean? Doing, not doing what I want to do, right? Doing what God wants me to do. Has the law been done away with? Oh, wait, it's the law of love, right? Let's, let's turn to Romans chapter 13. Let's see, what, let's see what the Apostle Paul says about the law of love. Starting in verse 8. Romans chapter 13, starting in verse 8. Owe no man anything but to love one another. For he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. Right? That's it. You love someone, you fulfilled the law. Well, no, it continues. For this, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet. Where, where do we find those commandments? Those are in the Decalogue, right? So they must still be in effect. Now listen to what he says after. And if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this samely, name, uh, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Love worketh no ill towards his neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. Folks, those, that's, that's within 10 chapters of each other in one book in the Bible. 
in the New Testament. Exactly, in the New Testament. That's important too, because people want to throw out the old, right? So you don't have to be a, a, a genius to figure this out. He says stuff in, in Romans chapter 2 as well. There's, there's other parts we could have looked at. They use Paul. They say the law has been done away with. What did we just hear? Has the law been done away with? Are we, are we not under the law anymore, but we have a new law, the law of love? Well, how, how is that described by Paul? By keeping the commandments. That will be the difference. That will be the difference in these last days. Those who follow the Bible versus those who tear it apart and twist it. Now, the image of the beast is the, is the Protest, apostate Protestant, really, evangelical churches coming together in the U.S., forming that image, as we saw. After an ecumenical meeting in 2014, of course, we know this stuff's been going on for some time. Our own church, sadly, included in this, in these meetings with the Pope. Ganun Diop, Joel Osteen visits the Pope. Billy Graham, we have Kenneth Copeland here. America's pastor, Rick Warren. I think Bill Hybels as well. Um, but this is after an ecumenical meeting in 2014. Kenneth Copeland said this. This is from an article by Damon Whitsell, July 27, 2014, from the Word on the Word of Faith. .com, or .wordpress.com. After an ecumenical meeting in 2014, Kenneth Copeland said this, I am so blessed. What Jesus asked the Father for in John 17, 21, that we may all be one in him, is finally coming to pass. Pope Francis is a man filled with the love of Jesus. All eight of us in our meeting together with him are moved by the strong presence of the Holy Spirit. Do you believe that? Do you believe that the Holy Spirit was working to form a union between evangelical churches and the Antichrist power? It was a spirit. Yes, there was a spirit there for sure. I have no doubts about that. It goes on, it says, and our love for one another was strengthened beyond measure. Like I said, I am so blessed. What a time to be a believer. What a time indeed to set up the image of the beast. Again, we see things going on in the United States right now. Maybe some of us think the unbelief is just like a tidal wave going over the country. The exact opposite is actually happening behind the scenes. America is going to get very, very religious soon again. And it won't be a good thing. But it's an opportunity for us, as people are, because there are people seeking the truth, that we give them the real truth, not the image of the beast. Paul? You know, the stage is being set quietly and stealthily, and we're told that the end movements will be rapid one. We're just going, we're going through a year and a half plus of COVID. Now this storm, Joe Biden can say whatever he wants. However, a lot of people are not buying it. They believe that this is God's displeasure. I, I mean, it's coming over the airwaves. So a couple more of incidents like this, where's people's minds gonna be? Because this is gonna affect the economy. And like we were talking before, I'm, I'm amazed that this economy has not collapsed in this country yet. Only be, I believe the Lord wants to finish the work and that's the only reason it hasn't. Anyhow, but going along with what you're saying, a couple more things like just, uh, that are happening, people are gonna be screaming for God. And right now, Paul, what are all people's eyes on right now? The government. The government. They're gonna save us. Absolutely, but specifically as, as, the, as the, the calamity in the land. What's the calamity in the land? COVID, right? Yeah, oh, right. Vaccine passports. And instead, we're focusing on that, right? Yeah. Instead of doing what? Giving this message. Does Revelation mention vaccines specifically? Doesn't. Does Mrs. White in great controversy? 
I'm not saying we don't talk about it with people. It's a huge opportunity when you're in a, when you're in a personal discussion with someone on a personal level. But to make that your message, that's not the cross we've been called to die on, friends. It's just not. It might upset us. If you're a patriot like me, it might burn within you to see the country imploding and becoming a dragon before our very eyes. It might bother you like it does me. But this is our message. This is the work God has given us to do. And we can't tell other people that they're focusing on the wrong thing, like when they're talking about the Holy Spirit, or when they're talking about the 2520, or when they're talking about the flat earth and stuff and saying that they're wasting time if we're focused on COVID, 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 COVID all the time instead of these messages to tell people that things that are happening behind the scenes and what the true calamities that are going to come upon this earth are. Again, I'm not saying you don't discuss it with people. That's fine, but just don't make it your message. Here's an example of Protestant evangelical leaders meeting with the papacy. I think this is from a meeting back in 2016. It's uh, John and Carol Arnett right here. Catch the fire. Brian Stiller, World Evangelical Alliance. Kenneth Copeland, Pope's right-hand man, apparently. Kenneth Copeland. Thomas Schreiermacher. World Evangelical Alliance, again, Human Rights Division. How much of an oxymoron is that? Jeff Tunacliffe, right here, and also World Evangelical Alliance. James and Betty Robison. Life Outreach International. Tony Palmer, who's now dead. He was the one that, that claimed, he, he represented of the Episcopal churches. He was the one that, that claimed out loud that the protest is over. Do you remember that? The protest is over. Then you have Darlene Sheck. I don't know if I said that right. Hillsong member. Right? It's in the music, too. Also, Chris Valaton, Bethel Church, Redding, California. Stacy Campbell, here. She's a Canadian prophetic council. She's a prophet. Did you know that? Yeah, she's a prophet meeting with the Pope. You think she's a true prophet if she's meeting with the Pope? You know, people, people beat Ellen White down and say that she was possessed by demons and everything. Did she, did she ever meet with the Pope? Did she ever write nice things about him? Interesting. And then you have over here, <clears throat> the last one, it's Mike and Diane Bickle of uh, International House of Prayer, IHOP. Right there, next to the Pope. See, this fusion between... Protestantism has been happening for some time. But in the last few years, it's, it's, it's really come together in a way that we haven't seen before, even affecting and impacting a church called the Seventh-day Adventist Church. This is from Empowered 21 meeting in 2017. Uh, this quote is uh, by Empowered 21 Global Council members celebrate a renewal within Pope Francis from Charisma News. That's the title of the article. May 31st to June 4th, 2017 saw over 50,000 Catholics, Pentecostals, and Evangelicals from over 130 nations unite together to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the beginning of the Catholic Charismatic Renewal, which began in 1967. Empowered 21 Global Council members, Glenn Burris, Foursquare Church International, who is the co-chair of E21 Evangelist Commission, Nick Hall of Pulse, Sammy Rodriguez of NHCLC, Vincent Sinan of Oral Roberts University, David Wells of Pentecostal Assemblies of Canada, and Dr. William M. Wilson, the Oral Roberts University president and E21 co-chair all participated in the celebration representing the global spirit empowered movement. The golden celebration was blessed and a significant event. Some of the speakers that were there were Ravi Zacharias, 
These are titans. He's deceased now, but these are titans in the evangelical world. Louis Giglio, Christine Kane of Hillsong, Josh McDowell, Tony Evans, Francis Chan, Kirk Franklin, Nick Hall, Ronnie Floyd, Sammy Rodriguez. The musicians that performed there, Casting Crowns, Hillsong United, Lacree, Carrie Job, Crowder, Michael W. Smith, Matt Mayer, Passion, Jeremy Camp, and Lauren Daigle. Some of the biggest song, uh, names in the Christian world for musicians are Casting Crowns and Hillsong. Michael W. Smith's up there too. And these performed in celebration of the Antichrist. Think about that. This fusion has already happened. We're just waiting for them to act now. They're not, they're, not, they're not shaking hands and making friends and meeting for the first time anymore. They've fostered a relationship. They've built rapport with each other. And now we're just waiting for the actions and plans which they've put into place to come to fruition. We're waiting to see when the image of the beast will be set up. And we are standing as, as on a precipice. We are on the brink of seeing this come. Now, it talked about worship. What is worship? Worship is keeping God's commandments. There's one commandment directly related to worship. Actually, two. Directly related to worship, and that is the Sabbath commandment. Also, the second commandment. Both commandments have been targeted by papal Rome. One of them was removed completely. The other one was changed. From the Great Controversy, page 446, the special characteristic of the beast and therefore of his image is the breaking of God's commandments. Says Daniel of the little horn, the papacy, he shall think to change times and the law. Daniel chapter 7, verse 25. And Paul styled the same power the man of sin who was to exalt himself above God. Our prophecy is a complement of the other. Only by changing God's law could the papacy exalt itself above God. Whoever should understandingly keep the law as thus changed would be giving supreme honor to that power by which the change was made. Makes sense, right? Such an act of obedience to papal laws would be a mark of allegiance to the Pope in the place of God. Does that make sense? For instance, let's say that there's some guy, there's some guy, I don't know, in Asia or Russia somewhere, and he stood up and he said, you know what, the Sabbath is Wednesday. Would you start keeping Wednesday? Why? Why not? He just said it was Wednesday. He, he's not an authority, right, Jesse? He's not an authority at all when it comes to things related to the Bible. He can say whatever he wants. doesn't make it true. Now, now let's take that same scenario. Let's say this, this random guy in Russia jumps out of his house one day and says, the Sabbath is Wednesday and the whole world starts to keep it. Against the Bible, who are they honoring then at that point? Are they honoring God, or are they honoring this guy in Russia? Because whose authority are they acknowledging? His, right? It's the same thing with the papacy. The papacy it is literally the same thing. <laughs> the papacy changed the day of worship, not in reality, in his mind, to Sunday. They transferred the solemnity, they say, of the day from Sabbath, the seventh day of the week, Saturday, to Sunday. The problem is, is that people acknowledge it. People keep it. People keep Sunday. Look around. How many people are worshiping today? Only the Seventh-day Baptists and the Seventh-day Adventists and some other Sabbath-keeping groups. What is everybody going to be doing tomorrow? I know we know because sometimes we take advantage of that, don't we? We know that there's not going to be people out on the road as much and that if we need to do some errands and things like that, that we should do them around 8 o'clock in the morning. If we go pick up something from the store, we should do it around that time because they're all going to be at church. 
That's the problem. They're acknowledging the authority of the papacy, just like Mrs. White said. They're worshiping the papacy by acknowledging his authority. Dr. Joshua, you want to add something? Yes, Go ahead. To, I want to ask you some Is it on? Very right. Yeah, thank you. I want to ask you something very important about Daniel 7, 25. Mm -hmm. That came out out of a kind of an argument that I heard a few weeks ago from a retired Seventh Adventist pastor saying in the church about he shall think to change times and the law. Mm -hmm. And then he said that the papacy, which I referred to him, that, that was the little horn, mm -hmm. he said that it didn't change the law, that he thought to change it. Could you please illustrate to me what is the trending in the, this new philosophy or theological dissertation that is going around yeah. about this? Because he even said that that only happened in Europe. But then I replied and said, excuse me, this, uh, this Sunday keeping tradition came to America. Yeah. The whole world kept the, the, uh, the Sabbath as Sunday. So he did change the law. Absolutely. And then he said, no. Uh, he thought that it was changed, but he didn't change it. So, I mean, this, this is something that I just wanted to bring to you. OK. Uh, well, well, I would say that, you know, I would say that the only reason it says he thinks to change times and laws is because he, you can't actually change God's law. And it's not like the papacy, papacy transferred the day and then God said, oh, let's go rewrite it and change it to something. That didn't happen. He did it in his head. It's only in his mind that the law, the actual law of God, the tablets that are underneath God's throne, the stone tablets that are out there still to this day, they say the seventh day. They don't say Sunday. They don't say the first day of the week. So that's what it means when it says he thought to change times and law. But in the, in the worldly scenario, he did change it. Yes, well, he did change. He changed... Right, it, right, but he didn't really change it. He can't really change it. So when people are keeping the law, the finger, exactly, it was written by the finger of God. So when pe he's changing the law in the sense of he has transferred the, the solemnity of the day to Sunday in his head, and he's used force to make other people keep it. But in reality, in heaven, no, he didn't change it. Paul, you want to add something? Yeah, just real quick. And the thing about this is so incredible because everything Rome does is behind closed doors. And then it, they have smoke screens, and then they spring the trap. This was up front. Yeah, we did it. Yes. And they signed their name to it in total defiance of the fourth commandment. And that, to me, is amazing when you read Daniel 7.25. To me, that's the f whole fulfillment of that verse right there. They sign their name to it. They're proud about it. And yeah, we have the power above God's that's throne. That's right. But to think is exactly correct. They may think they've done it, and they're going to use the might of this nation to enforce it. However, stand aside. The Lord's coming. That's right. You know. So Amen. yeah, the fact that they're so blatantly out in, out in front about it, right? It's the only thing. Everything else is done covertly That's and right. behind closed doors. But they want the universe to know that they have more power than God on this. That's earth. right. And they have that's quotes. What that's about. They have quotes to that effect. The church yes. is above the Bible, and the transfer of the day is a proof of that fact. Total fulfillment of that verse. The mere fact that they're so blatant about changing the Sabbath. So what should that tell us? What's exactly. the issue? Exactly. It's going to be the, ish, the main issue. It is the only issue. So, just a biblical example here. First uh, Samuel chapter 15, verses 20 and 23. You remember this? When Saul, when Saul worshipped God in his own way, right? 
It says, And Saul said unto Samuel, Yea, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord, and have gone the way which the Lord sent me, and have brought Agag, the king of, of Amalek, and have utterly destroyed the Amalekites. But the people took of the spoil sheep and oxen, and chief of the things that should have been utterly destroyed to sacrifice unto the Lord thy God in Gilgal. And Samuel said, and that wasn't acceptable, right? That wasn't acceptable at all. He wasn't obedient, was he? He didn't follow God's express commands, did he? He did not. Was he worshiping God then, even though he claims that he was? We followed the way of the Lord, was he? I never knew you. That's right. I never knew you. And Samuel said, Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice. In other words, they're directly related with worship because sacrifices that you offer to the Lord is worship, right? If you offer a sacrifice to some person on a regular basis, you are, you're worshiping that person, aren't you? So we would call that worship, but obedience is above that. So obey and worship side by side. And to hearken to the fat of rams, for rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft and stubbornness as iniquity and idolatry. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he also rejected thee from being king. Now, Rome agrees as well. This is something that the Bible, the spirit of prophecy, and as Paul brought out, Roman Catholic sources are in full agreement on this issue. This is what it says. This is from a Catholic source, obviously, from John Gilmary Shea, American Catholic Quarterly, January 1883, page 139. For ages, all Christian nations looked to the Catholic Church, and as we have seen, the various states enforced by law her ordinances as to worship and secession of labor on Sunday. Protestantism, in discarding the authority of the church, has no good reason for its Sunday theory, and ought logically to keep Saturday as the Sabbath. The state in passing laws for the due sanctification of Sunday is unwittingly acknowledging the authority of the Catholic Church and carrying out more or less faithfully its prescriptions. The Sunday as a day of the week set apart for the obligatory public worship of the Almighty God is purely a creation of the Catholic Church. They admit it. They're, they're clear on this issue. I hope we are. A couple more quotes, and we're going to close. This is from D.B. Ray, The Papal Controversy, page 179. From this same Catholic Church, you, Protestants he's speaking to, have accepted your Sunday, and that Sunday as the Lord's Day. She is handed down as tradition, and the entire Protestant world has accepted it as a tradition, for you have not an iota of Scripture to establish it. Therefore, that which you have accepted as your rule of faith, inadequate as it of course is, as well as your Sunday, you have accepted on the authority of the Roman Catholic Church. One more here. Albert Smith, Chancellor of the Archdiocese of Baltimore, replying for the Cardinal in a letter dated February 10, 1920. If Protestants would follow the Bible, they should worship God on the Sabbath day. In keeping Sunday, they are following a law of the Catholic Church. That's the issue, friends. That's the issue. Whose authority do you recognize? Because you can't recognize both. You can't have it both ways. You can't recognize the authority of the church, of apostate Protestantism's image, or Papal Rome's Sunday law, and still say that you are honoring God's authority because the two are in direct controversy with each other. We all have to make a decision. And this, by God's amazing grace, is such a simple one, isn't it? 
I'm not saying it's going to be easy, but it is simple. It's, are you going to keep God's law? Are you going to keep God's Sabbath? Or are you going to keep this man? Are you going to keep his law and end up where he's going? The lake of fire. Or are you going to keep this man's law? This man who doesn't live in palaces, who is bruised and beaten and torn apart and then died naked on a cross so that we might have the opportunity to make a choice. Will you choose The pomp, church, or the lowly peasant who loves you, who wants to take every step of pain, of hurt, and of joy, and always remain by your side and never forsake you. Whose law are you going to keep? Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, Lord, it is such an honor and a privilege to have all the light that we have. Lord, we ask that you would help us, embolden us, Lord, in these last days, that as the image of the beast is being set up, and we are watching that image being set up behind the scenes, Lord, that you would help us prepare our hearts and minds for the things that are coming on this world. Help us to get our houses in order and help us to make a decision. Give us the strength and courage and endurance to make a decision for you. In Jesus' holy name, amen.